and its purpose, um, and the UK to a, a degree too as, a, as, as an ally. And so I think the real challenge today is how you make sense of this shifting geopolitics. And in that, I think the position of India is absolutely critical because the progress of India in these last years has been remarkable and extraordinary. And I think the position of India now, this is again my view as an outsider, is potentially more powerful than it's ever been. Uh, with the G20, this is in a way a, a, a demonstration of its, of its authority on the global stage. But increasingly around the world, when countries are worried about whether they have to choose between the USA and China, I think India is a country seen by many as, a, as an objective friend. And I think it's got the opportunity now to lead the global south in a way that's never been true before. But your point of power being shared and not shifted so much, is the West prepared to share that power? Because I do not see a lot of enthusiasm on United Nations Security Council reform to start with. Yeah, but the West has got no option. And the, the trouble with the UN Security Council reform, which of course should happen, I mean, it's absurd that India is, you've got a situation where India is not a permanent member, but you could say that about other countries as well. But leave aside that, because the problem always with reforming the UN Security Council is how do you get consensus. But the West has got no option but to share the power. The question is how you make sense of international diplomacy in this new world. Dr. Jay Shankar, India today is a bigger, bigger economy than Britain. Uh, it is a geopolitical power. It is a post-colonial country that dominates the originally English sport of cricket. Would you call it a reversal of power? Would I call it? A reversal of power. Uh, <laughs> I would call it re I would call it replacement. Your sound, I don't think your sound. There yeah, I said I would call it rebalancing, but I would also say this is history which is switch hitting. It's hitting the <laughs> other way. <laughs> right? Not far wrong. Uh, but, no, but seriously, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, in history, you have these ups and downs. It's not often that actually uh, countries get a second or a third bite of the apple. Uh, I think India today is in a very unusual position uh, that uh, uh, it is once more a very decisively upwardly mobile which a lot of other civilizational states, uh, barring one, actually uh, are not uh, anymore in a position to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, where, where the UK is concerned, I think it's a very complex relationship. I mean, there's a, there's a lot, uh, uh, you know, the, the most uh, popular film in India last year uh, was a film called RRR. Uh, and this was, had to do with the British era and just, uh, I'm trying to put it delicately, you were in the nice, you were in the nice guys in the movie. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the reason I say... Can I, I sit here as a South African? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no. Uh, <laughs> please. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, well, you know, the, the fact is, uh, when you have this kind of complex history, uh, there would be the, the downside of it, there would be the suspicions, there would be the unresolved problems. Uh, uh, at the same time, there will be bonds, there will be similarities, and, and uh, uh, you know, cricket uh, happens to be uh, one of them. Now, in terms of the shifting weight of cricket, uh, uh, when it started to shift, Actually, people, I think, suggested we were better at the business of cricket than in the game of cricket. I think by now, barring this match, uh, uh, <laughs> by now, I think the game of cricket has shifted, shifted as well. So, uh, that's the kind, you know, that's the kind of things which are happening in the world today. The world is changing, uh, you know, there's the old, there's the new, there's the old which is now the new. Would you say we've also aced the politics of cricket, not just the game? We've been able to successfully weaponize it specifically against some of our Western neighbors. 
No, I, I, I won't, we don't weaponize anything. We are nice people. Uh, I, I, I strongly, I strongly uh, rebut that. Look, uh, I, you know, uh, when anything is successful, there's a natural desire to be part of that. Now, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's understandable, but if you want to be part of what is, what is good, what is decent, what is doing well in the world, then it's also uh, uh, expected that uh, the rest of your behavioral pattern would, would reflect that. So, so I think that's a, that's a bit of an odd case. Uh, but I, I'm, I, you know, uh, I don't think uh, anybody really wants to uh, weaponize it or politicize it. I think there are understandable sentiments. I mean, cricket, you know, is much more serious than a game. And therefore, the, all the sentiments go along with it. Kevin Peterson, um, the game of cricket was introduced to India by some British traders. Uh, back in the 18th century or the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, today, India ranks higher than England in the ICC and higher than South Africa. <laughs> How do you see this journey, um, India's journey, both on the cricket pitch and the geopolitical arena? Yeah, I mean, a fascinating debate, and uh, thank you so much for, uh, for, for bringing me to India again. It is a place that I, I love. Uh, I've been coming here for 20 years now. Uh, and the country just keeps getting better and better. With, I think with the world and where the world is at the moment, cricket or sport can be the one that sort of unifies the world. I, I, I think uh, talking about South Africa, we saw what happened to South Africa in 1995 when South Africa won the Rugby World Cup and what r sport did for South Africa. Uh, you saw what it did again a, a couple of years ago when, when South Africa won and Sierra Khaleesi gave that whole speech uh, and I will reference rugby, but then I'll also reference uh, the, the opportunity within sport uh, and, uh, and how that can be a leader in the sort of uh, tumultuous world that we're living in at the moment. Uh, there's conflict everywhere. I don't sit here, I sit here as an ex-sportsman, I sit here as a father of two children. Uh, and I was just speaking to Tony just uh, in, in the back of the, the hall there about where the world is at uh, and, and where we see the world. And, and as Joe Public, the world is actually a very scary place for us. And so for me sitting here now, just trying to understand uh, so many different opinions, you hear Russia speak uh, uh, only an hour or so ago, you then hear uh, the, the, the gentleman last night, you hear Bill Gates talking about certain ways the world's going. I can just say from my side that the world for, for Joe Public is a very scary place. Digitally, scary. The war, scary. Pandemics, future pandemics, scary. So when we talk about cricket and we talk about that opportunity to unite, sport should be used, sport can be used. The relationships between England uh, and India, I mean, I was one of the first guys that broke away from, from England and, and, uh, and had that sort of uh, separation from the national side because of my affiliation with India and the IPL and the start of the IPL. You now have a look at the world of cricket that we're talking about. All the players from all around the world, friendships, almost homes here in this beautiful country. That's what cricket has done. English players, great friendships with Indian players. Indian players have great friendships with English players, with players from the Caribbean. Australian players. I know you guys are playing in a huge series at the moment against Australia. During, before and after those games, the friendships are rife. And so I think that sport can be used in some sort of fashion to be able to try and mend it. Cricket's an issue because China and America don't play cricket. <laughs> Russia definitely don't play cricket. Interesting you say that because you're also the one who's highlighted uh, politics in the boardroom and the dressing room and you've written about it and how, how did that impact you as a player? How did it impact your game? And, and your idea of what it takes to be a leader. Yeah, I, I don't think, pol yeah, I mean, on the flip side, I don't think uh, politics should merge with sport in a, in a manner where it, it, it picks teams uh, and it favors um, different people. Um, but I actually think the world has changed a lot since I wrote that book. And I actually think that right now, 
any opportunity to unify and to unite, uh, whether it's countries, whether it's people, I think it needs to happen. The world has changed so much. I mean, we've just been through a pandemic. The last couple of years have been chaos for all of us. So if there are new opportunities and we need to change the way that we think, I think now is the right time to do it. And if cricket in this conversation is something that can be used, or sport is a conversation that can be used, why can't we use it? Sure. Dr. Jay Shankar, from, from honorable rivalries to, to now very vicious personal attacks, would you say sledging both in cricket and in politics has become part of the co part for the course? The personal attacks was the politics or the, the cricket? <laughs> uh, but anyway, I know the answer. Uh, now look, you know, if I could just pick up on something which Kevin said. Uh, he spoke about sports, cricket specifically, as a way of bonding, of, of uh, uniting. Uh, uniting. I also look at it in a slightly different way. I mean, think of us, you know. We're from the world of sports, from the world of politics, from the world of diplomacy. And what is common amongst the three of us? All of them are extremely competitive activities. So the end of the day, you know, sports or politics or diplomacy are ways of taking your competitive spirit into a particular domain. Now, uh, when you speak about leadership, uh, Leadership is about making choices, uh, having the courage to make the choices at difficult moments in the middle of a competition. And, uh, you know, in, in anything which any of us would have done, uh, a large part of it is drilling for it on a regular basis, the sort of, uh, the, uh, I would say, uh, the going to the nets which you would do in every business or as a regular routine but also the mental strength and the experience and, the, uh, and sometimes the innate talent to take the tough calls uh, at the right time. Now, when you are competitive, uh, yes, sometimes competitive competition can be very extreme and that's the kind of, uh, you know, uh, situation you are talking about. It will happen because not everybody would play by the rules. Not everybody, uh, sometimes it could be temperament, uh, sometimes it could be the compulsions of a situation. Uh, it can happen. Uh, but I would say, uh, you know, in, you know in, my, in my own way of working, I, I think if I have colleagues in the room, they would bear me out. I often, uh, in uh, diplomacy or in strategizing, use uh, cricket analogies. You know, I would say, I would take a particular match or a particular player and use that to get across to them that that's what I expect or that's what I think we should do or that's the kind of risk we should take. Uh, and, uh, uh, to, you know, and in all of this one has to plan for the fact that uh, there will always be sledging, there will always be uh, something beyond the rules, you know, something from the, as this say in another continent which doesn't play cricket from the left field. Right. I, I want to quote from what uh, Mike Pompeo recently said about you in his book. He called you, and I'm quoting, a professional, rational, and a fierce defender of his boss and his country. And since you um, believe in cricket analogies, with a, with a captain like Prime Minister Modi, how do you really set your field? Do you play an aggressive game and you know, close in on the batsmen, or do you focus more on, on guarding the boundaries mostly? Well, I think with Prime Minister Modi, with Captain Modi, there's a lot of net practice. I mean, uh, there's, yeah, there's, the net practice starts at 6 o'clock in the morning and goes on uh, till, till fairly late. Uh, but uh, again, you know, there's also, and, and I'm sure Kevin would agree, I mean, if you have uh, a particular bowler who uh, you trust in or you've seen perform, you would give them the latitude uh, the, you throw the ball to them at the right moment, you would trust them to, to deal with that particular situation. And I think uh, uh, in that sense, Captain Modi does give uh, his bowlers uh, a certain amount of uh, freedom. I mean, uh, he expects you to, to take that wicket uh, if he gives you the chance to do it. But uh, I would also say some of it is... Uh, watching the difficult decisions being taken. You know, 
Kevin was speaking about the pandemic. I mean, uh, all of us, if we look back at the last uh, three years, you know, the decision to lock down was a very, very tough decision. But it had to be taken at that point of time. And if we now look back, what would have happened if we had not taken that decision? The decision to, uh, to actually uh, push the uh, vaccines in the manner, the vaccine production in the manner in which it was done. Because, you know, uh, 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 it's, it's something which most people naturally wouldn't know. One of the reasons why Tony and I have been so closely in touch was through the pandemic, we were working uh, the, the raw materials uh, flow uh, for the, uh, for the uh, AstraZeneca, for the Covishield vaccine. Uh, so, uh, you know, to, to have the confidence to, uh, to be able to ha devise a program to vaccinate so much people. Or even, I would say, the call uh, to uh, send vaccines abroad. There was a lot of questioning of that. I mean, today, everybody says, yes, great idea, you know, we gave vaccines to 100 countries. And it was a tough call, because at that time, remember... So, to me, a lot of, whether it's sports, any, any competitive situation, is that willingness to take the difficult calls, stand by those calls, uh, give your people the confidence that you will stand by them when they take the risks. This is all about competition and leadership. Mm. Mr. Blair, I want to talk to you to talk about the, the tough calls. I'm sure you relate to that. And also now, especially when A, it appears more players are not playing by the rules around you. And B, you are constantly being questioned because, you know, the, the old boys clubs are, are over and done with. This is the age of social media. Um, mm. How does it sort of impact leadership? when you have to respond to the persistent questioning and demands of the millions on your feed and the billions on the street. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you didn't ask me to comment on the, the cricket since I, I'm a bit out of my depth on, on, on that one. Um, and by the way, you did ask actually, and I didn't respond about the UK-India relationship. It's a great relationship for the future today. Uh, and although he's not in my politics, there's a guy in Downing Street today um, that I think is some Indian connection. So uh, that's a demonstration, by the way, I hope of the open-mindedness of my country as well, which is a good thing to say. So you asked about leadership. Look, the thing about leadership in an era of social media is it's just got a lot more tough. Okay, because the thing about social media is it's, it's, I mean, it's frankly a plague on politics, really, because it is, it's the platform for the loudmouth. I mean, in the end, I mean, I'm, I'm going to offend some people here, but I'm sorry. But the fact is, one of the first lessons of leadership is to understand that those that shout loudest don't deserve to be heard most. Right. Unfortunately, social media, is, that's where they're shouting loudest. And so leadership's been the same since time immemorial. Leaders step up when others step back. Leaders are prepared to take responsibility and take decisions. And most of all, leaders know that criticism comes with the job. You know, I always say to people, if you don't want criticism, don't, don't become a leader. And, you know, I used to, sometimes I, I would complain to, you know, when I'd go in the flat upstairs from Downing Street and the media having a real go at me and things were a bit chaotic, let's say, you know, I'd shut the door of the flat and I'd sit down at the kitchen table and I'd start complaining. And my wife would always say to me, stop whinging, it's voluntary. <laughs> and, you know, she, she was right. I mean, you, you know, no one told you to go and become a leader. But if you're going to become a leader, understand that the essence of leadership is taking responsibility and being able to face the criticism. And there's one other thing, by the way, that good leaders do. And here, here I think cricket is a useful analogy. A good leader picks a good team. There you are. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Dr. Jayashankar, do you consider yourself part of the old boys club? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I uh, recently used the word old <laughs> and a few people commented on it. I wasn't obviously using it for myself at that point of time. 
Uh, old boy, no, old boy club, not really, because uh, in an in a interesting way, I think uh, 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 that kind of concept really doesn't exist in today's, today's India. Uh, certainly not, uh, not in the, you know, the, the kind of uh, environment that I've been in, neither in politics nor actually even in diplomacy uh, anymore. So the answer is no, I wouldn't consider myself uh, uh, to be part of the old boys club. Uh, in fact, uh, if anything, I would say you would try to, you know, as part of being uh, global, as part of being more multicultural, uh, you, you, whatever vestiges there may have been, I guess by now would have gone. Okay. But that's how I see myself. I mean, I don't know what you do. No, I've always wanted to ask you this question. How did the transformation from a diligent diplomat to a rock star neta come about? I mean, you're, you're being quoted by the German Chancellor. Meme makers are going through your speeches to look for content. Did you think foreign policy is going to become so popular in India when they say foreign policy does not win elections? This, this immense interest. You know, uh, uh, I think some of it is, is the times. It's the situation. Uh, yeah, again, we, we, we all agreed the world's in a very tough place. Because the world's in a tough place, I think more people are getting interested in the world. They're interested in the problems of the world. They're interested in the solutions of the world. The second is actually the globalization of India itself. You know, uh, ask yourself, uh, we have a million students Indian national students out in the world at any given point. Uh, there are 34 million Indians and people of Indian origin abroad in the world. And many other people of Indian origin in some way remain connected to India. Uh, so much, you know, many more Indians are traveling. Uh, many more Indians today have businesses outside, are exports are more. Uh, even at home, a lot of people sitting at home do more business outside. So uh, what has happened to my mind in maybe the last decade or so has been a very unconscious but actually a very deep globalization of India. And therefore young people especially, but not only young people, I think take much more interest uh, in the world than they used to. Now when they take interest in the world, you know, I guess they would like to see, uh, you know, like like a cricket team, you would like uh, to see, you know, people out there go and do, perform well, you know. You don't only want to win matches at home, you want to win matches abroad as well. Indeed, we do. Um, Kevin Peterson, you've been described as a, and I'm quoting, a maverick genius who refused to fit in and had to pay the price for it. Is that how you see your journey? And, and what does it really take to be an outlier in a world that is increasingly being led by people who who depend on data crunchers, who depend on processes and systems, and not always their gut feeling? I think you've just got to believe in yourself. Uh, and you've also got to believe in the people around you, as uh, Mr. Jaishank has just mentioned there now. It's, it's about using all your resources. And what Tony said about picking the right team and picking your best team. Um, and I think you've, in, in the world that we live in now, you've got to be so strong-willed and you've got to have that determination to, to do anything, almost anything, within the rules to succeed. Um, I think in this digital age that Tony alluded to there, I think it's incredibly difficult. Um, without accountability uh, for anything that anyone may say, anyone in this room may be saying something about one of us right now on their device with zero accountability. I think it's, it's, it's that self-determination and that sort of tunnel vision, tunnel vision to, to, to try and set yourself that goal to achieve something that cannot be interfered with. Um, my career was towards the end of that uh, boom in social media and I think I finished, well, I finished 2018 but 2000, sort of my, the, the height of my career was 2007 to 2012 to 13 and social media wasn't what it is now. I think it's a cesspit, if I'm honest, um, and I think it's a dangerous, dangerous place. Um, bringing up two young children again in this world, in this space, zero accountability, say what you want, it's a dangerous space. 
Um, so I was able to, luckily enough, sort of elude um, the issues that the world has today. Um, but that doesn't stop me sitting as Joe Public being fearful of what the world presents. Uh, and actually, the last couple of days have been quite enlightening, hearing the conversations, hearing the discussions that not normal people, or ordinary people, don't have access to what's being said over the last couple of days in some of the rooms that it's been said. So, to answer your question in three or four minutes, as I've done, it's that self-drive, it's that self-determination and making sure you have people around you that you can trust, more importantly. You have to trust people and you have to give the people the ability to tell you something if you're doing it wrong. Mr. Blair, is that how you see social media? Uh, as a necessary evil which has clearly changed the rules of engagement between leaders and their constituencies? Yeah, but I think you know, we, we, we focused on the, the negative side of technology um, and you know, technology does have its negative side. The thing I'd like to say though is technology has its positive side. I mean, we're living through a 21st century technology revolution that's every bit as um, revolutionary as the 19th century industrial revolution. And it's going to change everything. And basically, one of the great challenges of leadership today in politics is, is how do you harness the opportunities of that technology revolution? Because AI, cloud computing, bioscience, everything is going to change. The way we live, the way we work, the way we, we think and interact with each other. And the biggest challenge, in my view, is that the policy makers and the change makers are often in two different rooms not talking to each other. And they need to talk to each other. And the problem, when you are from a, an older, older generation, I'm definitely from the older generation, is that you know, technology is tough. I mean, I, was, I, I had to speak at a conference the other day on, on cryptocurrency. So, you know, I talked to my eldest son who's a, got a technology company about it and he tried to explain cryptocurrency and finally he sent me this thing called the idiot's guide to cryptocurrency. And I didn't understand it. So, <laughs> and then on the, in the eve, on the eve of the speech, I phoned him up and said, look, I'm about to address these people in half an hour. What on earth do I tell them? He said, tell them you're sick. <laughs> so make up any excuse but you're not fit for this dad believe me um, so, but the point is it, it, it is confusing and it isn't in one sense frightening and Kevin's absolutely right you know, you bring up children in a completely new world where they're subject to all sorts of influences and, and so on but this technology revolution is central and it's one of the reasons why India's done so well in these last years mm. because I think you know Prime Minister Modi has understood the importance of it, and your digital ID program, I think, I think it's one of the most important programs, I, I keep saying to people around the world, if you want to see an example of a reform that leads to real results and shows that government can work for people, look at India's digital ID program. It's been a remarkable transformation. And, you know, that's where, by the way, if you want to help some of the poorest countries in the world today, I think a lot of the poorest countries in the world, if they embrace technology in the right way with the right help, they, can, they don't have to replicate the legacy systems of developed countries. They can actually, in health, in education, and in the, in the role government plays, they can bypass all of that. So technology, yep, it's, it's got its downsides, but it's a fact, and if we understand it and we master it properly, we can make it work for people. Dr. Jayashankar, was this a sort of a conscious leadership call that this is the age of IPL, we don't want specialists, we want all-rounders, we want leaders who can deliver on policy and, and also communicate it uh, effectively? Uh, no, I, you know, that's a completely new uh, analogy you're using. You want all-rounders. I still think uh, you need specialist batsmen, right? <laughs> you need them all. Uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, all rounders have a use, but I think uh, you also uh, have people who have domain domain skills. Uh, my my sense today is uh, actually governance has become very complex. In an interesting way, uh, where politics is concerned, I w you know it's it's not so much.
Okay, so that was an exclusive conversation that you were hearing with Palki Sharma. Let's once again try and dip in. Tony was talking about uh, the, you know, the uh, digital, the Aadhaar-based delivery which is happening. Uh, wherever I go in the world, and it's actually, I mean, if you ask me today, uh, probably other than uh, Ukraine and the pandemic, if you ask me, okay, put those two aside, what is the subject you talk most to foreigners about? The subject I talk to them most about is actually what's happening through the digital backbone in India. That when they look at the, you know, the food delivery, the, the payments into the banks, the, uh, the Kisan, the, the farmer's support program we have, uh, the, each, each one of these, the pension schemes, the health access. Uh, the fact that we are able within the last few years to raise this into tens or hundreds of millions uh, and do this with a very high degree of credibility, very high degree of integrity, even, even vaccination, you know. Uh, after all, to, to create a platform to be able to, in an organized, uh, efficient manner, vaccinate two and a half, get two and a half billion shots in the arm is an incredible achievement. Mm. Now, what happens is when you're in the middle of an achievement, and I'm sure that must be happening in the middle of a match, you take, you know, you, you are engrossed in it. So you don't perhaps fully understand its value. It's when it's the spectator watching the match who's saying, you know, oh my God, these guys are doing this. So there is today, if you, if you look at the sense of India in the rest of the world, a lot of it is coming from these kinds of uh, achievements. Uh, and I think today part of politics is also to, to communicate that to people, to, so that they become participants in it. After all, you know, they are the beneficiaries, they are the stakeholders. So uh, in that sense, yes, uh, you know, uh, both the, in, a, in a curious kind of way, you've got to do more things. But in a, also in the same breath, I would say you've got to do your own thing that much better because people are going to hold you to account. Uh, much more strictly than before. So do you agree with them when they say that social media is dangerous? Uh, I have two and a half million followers and I like them. <laughs> so. Wonderful. Kevin Peterson. <laughs> How many? Two and two a half and million. A I, I started late. <laughs> <laughs> and I never started. <laughs> You've done well. <laughs> Your take on politics today, and, and since you've spoken about how so many things in the world today bother you. I, I think it's the poison chalice <laughs> at the moment, but I think with the poison chalice, chalice comes uh, incredible leaders. And if leadership is something that you want to get involved in and you are going to cop a lot of stick with, uh, and, and you want to accept it and you want to understand it and you want to acknowledge the fact that it's going to happen, then absolutely. I mean, just sitting here as Joe Public, uh, being invited to this conference and being privy to some of the conversations, I know I speak for a lot of people wanting the world to be a better place. Mm -hmm. I know I speak for a lot of people who, I mean, I can speak to most of the men in this room, and you argue with your wife. Sometimes you have to just accept that she's right even though she may not be right <laughs> but to have peace sometimes you need to do that and I just think that maybe people should get in a room and maybe people should just sit together and, and accept that it might not be ideal but what I'm trying to explain is that we're not living in a world which is very peaceful um, it may be a little bit safer not safer in some places um, and I live in London I live in the UK um, the UK has a lot of issues, a hell of a lot of issues. Um, so I suppose I just sit here saying, will I get into public or politics? Absolutely not. But as somebody who uh, has access to rooms like this, and, and lucky enough around the world can have access to some pretty cool people and some fun conversations, if there are people in this room who can make this world a better place and can say to their wife, yes, you're right, even though you're not right, but for peace, make it happen. Please. I think just getting people together in the room is sometimes not enough. You can ask Dr. Jayashankar. He tried yesterday. 
that I understand as well. When you're playing against Australia, you're playing against India, sometimes things don't work. They may not work for the first month, they may not work on the second trip, but on the third trip, they might work. Right. Do you want to comment? Uh, I was just tempted to say I wasn't negotiating with my wife. <laughs> 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 right. I'm not sure if you're supposed to take audience questions. No? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to thank you all for your comments and uh, I'm sure your words will inspire many and uh, will give guidelines for leaders of the future. Thank you very much. And all thank the best. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was the prestigious Raisana Dialogue. We'll